President and CEO of CCA, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to uh, CCA's convention, our 2014 annual convention. I hope you had a chance last night to uh, uh, enjoy the TNS uh, uh, after hours party. I know I did. Uh, hope you didn't spend there uh, uh, too late last night. Uh, ready to go this morning, get you some um, coffee and some uh, something to eat. And uh, we want to thank our sponsors for the breakfast this morning. Erickson, that's uh, here for Erickson. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and we'll just uh, get down to business. Um, uh, we had a, have a great line of speakers lined up this morning. We've got some really good uh, breakout sessions uh, for us uh, this afternoon. So uh, I'd like to welcome those uh, of you that are joining us via live stream. Uh, this, uh, this morning, uh, RCR Wireless is a media partner, and they're providing the, the broadcast uh, for the uh, sessions. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our Pinnacle sponsors <clears throat> who make this uh, event possible, and we'll be hearing from some of them today. This year includes Alcatel-Lucent, Ericsson, Huawei, Interrupt Technology, Sprint, Cineverse, and TNS. And thank you all for your support. Very much appreciated. So we have a lot of sessions planned today and throughout the convention, so uh, let's get started. A quick reminder, we um, have a very useful convention app, and uh, I think it will help you make uh, better use of your time. So uh, if you don't need convincing to use the app, let me just say that we're going to uh, give some awards out for those people are, that are uh, 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 the higher users of the app. So. Uh, you go on and uh, go in, register, uh, download the app, have a chance to win some cash prizes. Uh, we'll be giving it out on Wednesday. So um, let's turn to the issue at hand. Um, you know, as you know, CCA is an advocacy-driven organization, a carrier-centric advocacy-driven organization. And we focus on carrier policies, public policies in Washington, D.C. And last year, I think we had a... Um, a very busy year because of the challenges that were facing many of our uh, members. And, um, but I'm very pleased to say that I think we had a very successful year in many respects. Some of these policy wins that we uh, you know, were uh, fortunate to, to uh, deliver uh, will help make our carriers remain competitive and hopefully uh, survive and thrive in the, in the months and years to come. But uh, it, it also uh, was helpful for not just the rural, small rural carriers, but every carrier that's out there trying to uh, compete against a duopoly. Uh, there's an entire mobile ecosystem that has benefited by uh, sustaining the competitive carriers. We're talking about device manufacturers, infrastructure developers, billing companies, software companies, many, many more. It is an entire uh, entity of small businesses that support uh, the, the wireless industry, and we thank uh, everyone for their support of CCA. Uh, they're all impacted one way or another by some of the decisions in Washington, D.C., and that's what we're there to, uh, to hopefully uh, uh, watch over and, and make an impact on. One of the greatest successes this past year, uh, and I think you've probably heard it, uh, it's been around the issue of interoperability. After months, Actually, after years of, of work, we finally found a solution uh, to address some of the competitive carrier needs. And under the leadership of the F then FCC Chairwoman Mignon Clyburn, uh, we worked diligently with the FCC and her office to uh, find an uh, answer to interoperability. And we restored interoperability to the lower 700 megahertz band. And uh, Commissioner Clyburn will, uh, will address the, uh, the CCA convention on Wednesday. So uh, on Wednesday morning, I hope you have an opportunity to come and listen, listen to her speak. But this was a major triumph for the com competitive carriers. The new policy uh, finally allows our carriers to uh, actually use over $2 billion of a spectrum that was essentially tied up and unusable. And uh, we hopefully will create new job opportunities, new services for customers, and new access to new uh, services. So uh, implementation of that is under the way. We're going to watch it. We're going to watch it carefully. We're going to make sure that the deadlines that uh, were set by the FCC and uh, our uh, industry agreement with uh, uh, AT&T and others, uh, that um, we actually hit those targets. And, uh, and we're also uh, going to try to be helping ourselves on the way, encouraging OEMs to produce and provide devices that operate on that spectrum. Another, I think, uh, real uh, win 
uh, it was real progress this year was on the 600 megahertz auction. I know we talked a little about that yesterday with Mr. Wheeler. Uh, we work very closely with FCC to ensure that every carrier has an opportunity to bid and win spectrum in this 600 megahertz ecosystem that is going to be uh, coming available here in, within the next year. So every carrier wants to improve services to the customer and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were there to fight for your access to, uh, to do just that and get access to more spectrum. The FCC should be commended uh, for designing the rules for this historic auction. It's a forward reverse auction, never been done before. Um, and uh, uh, I think they should be committed also for the, uh, the, the geographic size, regardless of the size, the geographic location, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity to participate. And we're most proud of the FCC's decision to actually follow our recommendations on partial economic areas. We mentioned this just a little yesterday. EAs, the economic areas, were so huge that uh, many of our carriers would have had to bid on uh, license areas five, six, ten times their actual footprint. That's just economically unattainable. And I think with the partial economic areas, uh, uh, this it will give every carrier an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to join in the, um, in the auction. And I must say, I, I I appreciate the cooperative nature that all our carriers took when we, when we presented this. Some of our larger carriers like Sprint and T-Mobile, uh, that may have not been their first choice. Um, but uh, they realized there's uh, some benefit in the unification of uh, positions. And I think we all came out a little better because we cooperatively worked together. And I think that was a good uh, lesson for us all. Uh, the FCC incentive auction order also includes a number of other issues that I think level the playing field. For example, this 30 megahertz reserve, uh, never been done before. Uh, we heard Chairman Wheeler suggest that in his, his, eye, his, his eye, his thought was that actually enhances the competitive nature of the auction. And I think we, uh, I know we agree. So um, it's a huge opportunity for the small carriers to, to uh, to get in on the auction for those who don't have low band spectrum. It's another great opportunity. And this auction will probably be a game changer. It's probably the, the last time in the next decade or more that you're gonna have a green field opportunity for low band spectrum. So uh, we're gonna to continue to monitor that very carefully. Of course, there are other issues that remain unresolved. And we heard a little about that yesterday and that is that Mr. Wheel wants us all to show up to the auction uh, which I think uh, the, the demand is pent up and there, there will be a desire to do that. But we also have to um, uh, look at the, reserve, uh, the re reverse side of the auction, and that is uh, we have to get the broadcasters to show up. And somehow or another, we have to maximize broadcaster participation. And I must admit that uh, it is difficult to, uh, to, to recognize that uh, the only measuring device or a measuring stick we have right now in order to uh, encourage the broadcaster participation is just pure cash. Uh, it's, um, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's easy to understand uh, that they would like to uh, receive more funds for spectrum that they uh, got from the U.S. taxpayer, but we definitely would like to utilize that spectrum in a more efficient way. So we're gonna work on that. Now, I think another great policy uh, win came just last month on Capitol Hill. I don't know if you noticed, but the device unlocking. Uh, we worked for uh, over a year, testified at the Library of Congress on the Hill uh, to try to get the, uh, the right decision on device unlocking. And um, we uh, took the position that the consumers uh, should have a right to take their device to the carrier of their choice. And um, so we finally got device unlocking and it, it became a reality. When President Obama assigned into law S-517, uh, the Unlocking Consumer Choice and Wireless Competition Act uh, in August. So consumers can now take their device uh, they're choosing to the network and you need not worry that you're committing a felony if you unlock it. Um, uh, it's, as I know it sort of, sort of sounds sort of crazy that we had to go to all that trouble with the Librarian of Congress making a very poor decision on uh, device unlocking, but uh, uh, successful, uh, successful effort and hopefully our carriers will, will benefit from it. You know, we, we did a study uh, last year to show that, um, that devices are a uh, primary consideration for consumers and in many instances cons consumers actually look to the device before they look to the carrier. Uh, that they're going to choose. That's huge. Uh, devices continue to be a, um, 
uh, a, a, an issue for us, one of those, as I call oxygen issues. This just goes to show how important it is that we get access to, uh, to uh, high-end uh, handsets. And uh, every uh, small carrier uh, lacks a scope and scale that, to attract a lot of manufacturers. So we're trying to do things uh, uh, innovatively that can help us uh, get access to those uh, new devices. And speaking of devices, I think there's a, um, a company today uh, by the name of Apple is going to make a big announcement um, today regarding their latest device. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what it's going to have in, in it. I, uh, I, I understand there's a lot of secrecy around these things, as you all know, uh, having, uh, some of you having worked with uh, Apple. Certainly appreciate their device, but I certainly hope that their announcement will benefit all carriers and consumers uh, by making their latest creations available to everyone. You know, I encourage device manufacturers to keep talking to our members uh, because every carrier, no matter how big or how small, needs uh, access to these devices. And it just, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right that if you have a carrier that's willing and eager to sell that uh, high-end, iconic, smart device and provide that opportunity to their consumer, uh, they, it just it seems to me that there ought to be a better way than deny uh, small carriers that opportunity and as a consequence, <clears throat> potentially lose competitive uh, footing in the marketplace. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, no OEM should actually be able to dictate how many competitive carriers there are in the market. And, uh, and I think that's one issue we, we talked to Mr. Wheeler yesterday about. We're going to continue to pursue um, an open debate, an open dialogue of how we can uh, improve that situation. And uh, so that's on our list. Roaming, uh, we mentioned roaming just a little. Of course, uh, it's nice to have the good devices, but you've got to have uh, uh, roaming. And data roaming uh, ranks right up there among uh, the other issues like interoperability. And we're very pleased uh, the FCC adopted the data roaming order, but um, there are still challenges faced by many of our carriers. So we remain focused on data roaming, and we're going to work to find solutions there. Um, and let me be clear, our, our purpose is advocacy. That's our priority. And we're very practical and realistic about that, that even if you win sometimes on the policy side, um, that alone may not be able to, uh, to deliver the results that you need. So uh, even as we, as we achieve those successes, uh, we still need to uh, uh, find ways to help ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why our business innovation group, uh, made up of uh, carriers, uh, is so important to us. The group makes up... Uh, uh, a, a core group of, I think we have 35, 36 carriers, and if you're a carrier and you want to be part of the in business innovation group, um, talk to Brad Blanken, give us a call, uh, get on the calls and find out what uh, your colleagues uh, are sharing and networking and talking about and uh, help us find solutions for everyone. <clears throat> but uh, it's sort of our effort to help us help ourselves, and uh, I think we can do that collectively. Um, as I mentioned, data roaming is a prime example of, of one of the business solutions we're working on. It's, uh, we have a data hub uh, that we're working on, uh, CCA uh, uh, and, and, and Sprint, and some of our uh, seven, 16 and 17 members on the steering committee, uh, powered by uh, TNS uh, as the, uh, essentially the, uh, the hub supervisor. And as you may recall, in the Global Expo in March, uh, Sprint announced its commitment to, uh, to develop a robust nationwide uh, footprint using uh, CCA members and partnering with CCA members. Uh, we also have T-Mobile partnering with us in the, in the hub. They're on the steering committee, and we hope that we can uh, bring in solutions that help not, not only uh, CDMA but also GSM carriers uh, and find uh, choices and collective opportunities for uh, growth in that area. And I'm very pleased that Sprint has already announced, uh, I think uh, they did an announcement the other day, another 17 carriers uh, taking advantage of their uh, preferred program. So we're up to like 25 uh, carriers, and uh, hopefully we, uh, we can make some more progress. Um, this is a solution that uh, I think uh, has, a, has a practical impact, practical impact that also affects your bottom line. Uh, so building on this success, we've also uh, engaged uh, our members on trying to create a um, uh, device hub, and uh, I think the CCA device hub, with your good help uh, of the of the carriers involved, will uh, um, will find better ways to get access to to devices, the portfolio of devices from uh, not only Sprint but hopefully others, 
and with AppCudo and uh, Interop Technologies helping uh, find solutions uh, for connectivity. I hope we will make some real progress on that also. These are uh, sort of the uh, solutions that, that our carriers are, are asking for and demanding, and we're trying to be responsive in coming up with uh, innovative uh, business solutions. And if you'd like to learn more about any of those, uh, please drop by the CCA booth, talk to Brad Blanken, uh, love to share the information with you and, and, and get, your, get your involvement. I also want to remind you that membership in, in, uh, in, in itself is an automatic invitation to come join uh, CCA's activities. We have uh, committees, uh, an events committee, you can come join. All the events, all the breakout sessions, they were uh, essentially decided upon and, 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 and staffed and created by, by you, by the carrier and vendor members that are on the events committee. It's not uh, astroturf, as I would say. Somebody didn't come in and do it for you. This, these, are th these are issues that our members said we want to know more about. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things that make us a little unique, and that is um, we're trying to be responsive to, uh, to our carriers' uh, immediate needs for information and networking. And uh, uh, I'd note that um, uh, we have a uh, Washington reps group. And uh, I can tell you right now, if you want to know what's going on in Washington, D.C., and you want to know what the filings are, what the deadlines are, what are the issues, co mandates coming down the road, join the Washington Reps Group. It's a group of dedicated you know, professionals, policy professionals, general counsels, legal counsels from all the companies. They join a call uh, for about an hour, 45 minutes or so to an hour every Monday, and give you the latest and greatest. And we send out all the data and information you need. I mean, uh, I'm a recovering attorney myself. So I know that uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of costs associated with legal uh, work in Washington, D.C. Here's one great way to get the data and information you need in a very uh, efficient way uh, and a very low cost, and you have access to some of the best uh, regulatory minds uh, in Washington, D.C. We have uh, you know, three, four uh, outstanding outside counsel uh, law firms that work with us and help us, and, I, and I'm very proud of the, of the work that this Washington Reps Group uh, do uh, for everyone, and it, it really is a, is, is a tandem out to uh, the secret of our success on the policy front. And so uh, come join, find out if, uh, uh, if you too can take away some good information. We also do a Capitol Hill Day. Uh, with last year, I mean this year, this in, in June, we had over 100 uh, of uh, our members associate members and carriers come to Washington, D.C. We met with uh, members of Congress and the House and Senate. Uh, I think we did over 100 meetings in one day. So uh, come with your, uh, uh, with your comfortable walking shoes because we're gonna, we'll burn some shoe leather on Capitol Hill and you'll get to meet and greet and talk to your own members of Congress. So uh, please do that. There's nothing more effective than you, the constituent, the person that, uh, that works and lives and votes and maybe employs people in a member's district Nothing more effective, nothing more effective than you telling that member that this is what you need to stay uh, healthy in the, in the industry. So uh, we get enormous uh, benefit, uh, and we live vicariously off of that uh, contact with these members for, for some time. So I ask you, uh, please join. Uh, you can make of it uh, what you will, and hopefully if you'll spend a little time, we all will We'll make a better show of it in Washington, D.C. So now, without further ado, let me uh, get into today's agenda and uh, introduce our, our first speaker. And I'm pleased to introduce to you our first speaker, which is John Dow, who is Vice President of Wireless Business Development Americas at Alcatel-Lucent. And John brings with him over 20 years of experience in wireless cellular, IP networking, security industry, uh, experiences, and he also has seen the business from all sides, having risen through to his current position through a whole series of progression of positions, business development, strategy, marketing, finance, operations. Uh, very glad you're with us here today, John. So let me turn to the podium to John Dow. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, CCA, for giving me this opportunity to talk this morning. Uh, I know, appreciate the audience that's here. It's 8 a.m. in Vegas. That's a challenging time. Um, so I appreciate those of you who could make it out this morning. Uh, I'll do my best to make this worthwhile for you. 
I'm struggling with my voice a bit, and it's not because I went out last night. Knowing that we were going to be here this morning, I actually stayed in, but I live in Texas. And this time of year in Texas is football season. And for me, football season starts with my boys. And I coach one of the teams, and Saturday morning, we went into triple overtime for a first grade team. So if you wonder about football in Texas, just kind of keep that in mind. So needless to say, um, I'm an intense individual and lost my voice after about an hour and a half. So, um, so I'm going to kick right off and, and jump into trying to level set where are we today in providing and connecting uh, people across and businesses across the U.S. Right? And we're going to start by looking at our ability to provide three megabits per second of downlink to customers, whether it be businesses or individuals across the US. If you look in the rural American numbers, they're okay. And we clearly as an industry have made progress. You now have 90% of the households um, in rural America covered with at least three megabits per second. And in very, very rural areas, you have nearly 82%. Obviously, that's lower than if you're living in a major city, but it's clearly progress. Here's where the problem comes. I'm going to use a real technical term. We will go over a cliff when we go from 3 megs to 6 megs. It's, you now take and go from 90% covered down to 36%. Right? So at 3 megs, we have basic broadband. People can surf on the web, they can get emails, but you're not going to be doing streaming video consistently. Right? You're going to be running basic services. We really need to think about how at minimum we get everybody to 6 megs and recognizing that that's where we are today. But as you kind of fast forward, for years to come, that minimum requirement is going to continue to increase, and we'll talk a bit about that. When you go up to 10 megs, it really doesn't matter. Once you don't have six, it only gets worse when, when you look at 10 megabits per second. Right? So let's look at it, not from those that are served, but from the underserved. And what does that mean to us? So if you look at where we are today, say that roughly 18 million people are, have no service or are underserved. Right? And that has an impact. It's somewhere in the order of 6 to 7% of the households across the US. You can get into certain states where an individual state may have 15 or 20% of their household, households uncovered. And that has an impact. 